I don't know where it takes out. Oh, here we go. The entire screen. Okay, thermal properties then. We've done some thermal properties already. Essentially, uh, pressure, temperature of gases as part of thermal properties. Uh, the gas law is essentially part of thermal properties. Uh, it's not a bad thing that we we focused on temperature and pressure since they are since they are fundamental. But anyway, uh, some more thermal properties, specific heats. Uh, later, we'll come to molar heat capacities uh, when we do when we do thermal thermal dynamics. Right, specific heat then. Specific heat is the amount of heat that must flow in or out of unit mass of a substance to change its temperature by one degree. Um, so let, let's just picture that on the whiteboard. Um, it's always nice to have a picture of, uh, of formulas. Let's just take, let's suppose we weighed this thing. And this thing is unit mass. Mass equals one. It, I'm going to leave it as unit. It can be a kilogram. It can be uh, a gram. It depends on what, what units you've used uh, for your calculation. Because the value for specific heat can be given either in terms of kilograms or it can be given in terms of grams. Uh, the definition doesn't depend on the unit, it just depends on the fact that whatever units you're using, you use one of them. Uh, so if you heat this thing, then the amount of heat Q, let me call it QC, required to raise the temperature of unit mass by one degree centigrade or one degree Kelvin, remember the size of the units are the same, uh, and that is the specific heat. So the specific heat then is the amount of heat needed to raise unit mass of a substance by one degree and vice versa. It's the amount of heat given out when one, uh, when unit mass of a substance uh, decreases its temperature by one degree centigrade or one degree Kelvin. Uh, so that's my specific heat. This means that if I have a mass M of a substance, then the amount of heat I need to raise the temperature of mass M of a substance by delta T is given by this. Um, if you like, I can write this. I wonder if that's what this will help you. You can, if you like, say that the amount of heat I need to raise mass M of a substance through a temperature difference of delta T, Tf minus Ti, is proportional to the mass and proportional to the temperature change, and the constant of proportionality. So this is another way of looking uh, at the specific heat. Either way, uh, this is the formula. Rearranging this formula gives me um, a formula for the specific heat from which I can get the units. This is a, obviously a very important formula that you'll need to be remember. Sometimes it helps to understand things by memorizing them at the beginning. So these formulas in boxes you should memorize and make sure you understand them. To get the units of specific heat, if I make specific heat the subject, Q is measured in joules. If I measure mass in kilograms, and if I measure temperature either in degrees or degrees Kelvin, it doesn't matter, um, we can get the units joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin or per degree centigrade. These two definitions are equivalent. There's also 
CGS units, centimeters, grams, and seconds, this older system of units, in which the unit for heat is the calorie. The unit for energy in general is the calorie. So in CGS units, uh, heat is measured in calories. We take the unit mass to be in grams, and again, the temperature change is still measured either in, in degrees centigrade or in degrees Kelvin. Uh, the relationship between uh, energy in calories and energy in joules is this. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. And the historical reason for this is because of Joule's paddle wheel experiment. This is an experiment in 1843 when Joule showed the equivalence of heat and energy. Uh, and it's called mechanical equivalent. Well, I'll show you why. I'll quickly just show you his experiment. You see, originally, when people started thinking about thermal properties, it actually had to do with the beginnings of thermodynamics. When people started to use heat engines, they heated steam, for example, and, then, and they drove pistons. So there was an interest in the relationship between heat and the work done. And this initiated the science of thermodynamics. And in the original thinking, people thought of uh, heat as a substance called caloric. Because I think everyone you know, if you uh, let me use liquids is probably a better idea. If I have a, a cold liquid and I pour a hotter liquid in it, then the hotter liquid gives up heat to the colder liquid. The same with a, an object. If I put a hotter object next to a cold object, we know that heat is transferred from the hot to the cold. And people viewed heat as a substance that went from the hot to the cold. But there was an engineer. The first idea is that heat was a, an, an, a form of energy. It came about by an, an engine that used to make cannons. And when you make a cannon, I don't know if you remember cannons, these old things where you shoot, shoot cannonballs out of. In order to make the cannon, you have to use a lathe to drill a hole in the, in the barrel of the, of the cannon. Now, what this engineer noticed is so that as the lathe was drilling the hole, was making the hole, heat was given out. The metal was getting, getting very hot. So he had the first suggestion that heat was a form of energy. And then Joule, in 1843, devised an experiment. It's a simple thing to picture. You put a load of water in a, in a tub or container of some sort. Then he connected a paddle wheel. And the idea was that as this thing rotated, it would heat the water. So he made it rotate by, my drawing was not very great. Huh? Basically he had a rope. Connected to two weights. Anyway, I want to do the, the, the calculation. You can find the proof of this, by the way, in a, Kelvin will go through the details of this. Basically, let these things fall. So, these things lost energy, MGH. And as they fell, this temperature increased. And so, Joule related the energy, the mechanical energy that was, lo uh, that was lost, and equated it to the increase in temperature. Again, the details you can look up in uh, in solo. And this is why then uh, we have this relationship between calories, which came about from the idea of a caloric, uh, to joules, which is a form of energy, and why there is this connection, and why it's called the mechanical equivalent of heat. Okay, without excursion, one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. And heat, now we know, is a form of energy. It's not a substance that, that flows from one thing to another. Uh, latent heats of vaporization. 
this comes about with the heat given out or absorbed when a, a substance changes phase. Uh, as soon as a... Yes? Go on. Uh, there are some people who want to be let in. Oh, thank you so much. As I said, once, once I'm on the whiteboard, I can't see uh, these things. Now, thanks for uh, reminding me. Latent heat, yeah. So th this has to do when a substance changes phase from solid to liquid. The And when it's changing from solid to liquid, heat is given out. When you want a liquid to change to solid, you, you have to uh, take heat away. Heat is lost. Uh, when you a liquid changing to a vapor, boiling, to change the liquid into a vapor, you, you supply heat. If you cool steam or cool the vapor down to become a liquid, the, the vapor loses heat uh, and becomes a liquid. So these tr transitions from solid to liquid, liquid to solid, uh, liquid to vapor, uh, vapor to liquid, these are phase changes. The key point about these things is they occur at a single temperature. Now, before we go on to the definitions, well, I can give you the definitions first and then the explanation later. Um, the amount of heat, for example, if you're going from, which one is this one? This one is vaporization. If you're going from a liquid to a solid, so if you have a massive liquid this amount, the amount of heat you need to supply to convert it uh, to vapor is given by this, where this is the latent heat of vaporization. If you want to uh, melt, if you have, for example, ice and you want to melt the ice or anything, any solid, if you want to convert the solid to liquid, if you have mass M of the solid, this is the amount of heat you need to convert it from solid to liquid. And this quantity is called the latent heat of fusion. Um, so we have then the latent heat of vaporization. This gives us the heat needed to convert mass M of a liquid into a vapor, or mass M of a vapor into a liquid. It goes both ways, and it's the same quantity whether you're going from liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid. And similar here, this is the amount of heat needed to change mass M of a solid into a liquid or mass, li or, or mass M of a liquid into a solid. Uh, and this all happens at constant temperature. Now the question is, why does it happen at constant temperature? Again, let's go to the whiteboard. Uh, let's get rid of this. Uh, let's just take boiling to begin with. Uh, let me just take a solid to begin with. Okay, I've got a solid. And I heat the solid. Let's say ice for the sake of, a, of, of argument. Is that a particular example? So I heat this thing. And it begins, let me say, put it in a beaker or something. Or a calorimeter. A copper container. Heat this thing, uh, and the ice melts, uh, and we get converted to water. During the time of melting, the temperature stays constant, and we know it stays at zero degrees. We de we've defined the temperature scale, so it, it stays at zero degrees centigrade. I'll use centigrade for this. It's easier to picture. Let me simplify the uh, ice. Now, any solid has atoms or molecules that kind of vibrate about fixed positions. There's a crystal structure, and the atoms and molecules are separated by a certain distance, but they don't change, they don't move around all over the place, they vibrate next to each other. But you know, in a liquid, 
the atoms and molecules of liquids are further apart and they fly about all over the place. So in order to convert a, a solid into a liquid, we have to supply energy so the molecules start vibrating more and more and more until eventually they have enough energy to break free. Um, something I haven't mentioned before, I don't know if you've heard of the kinetic theory of gases. In the kinetic theory, the faster the molecules, the higher the temperature. In other words, temperature in the kinetic theory is explained in terms of the kinetic energy of uh, molecules, so half mv squared. So the faster these things move, the higher the temperature. But here, we're heating, these things move more and more. Uh, why doesn't the temperature change? The reason is, is because there's potential energy between these, uh, the atoms and molecules. In other words, there's an attractive force. In order to separate them, you have to break that attractive force so they can escape and start moving about. So the energy doesn't go into increasing kinetic energy. It goes in separating the molecules until they become free. And this is why temperature doesn't change. Because the heat supplied during a phase change doesn't go into increasing kinetic energy. It goes into separating atoms and molecules. The other way around, if you cool this thing, you slow these things and you slow these things down until they start coming together. So they're giving out energy as they condense from a liquid back to a solid. So from solid to liquid, you must supply heat. When something, water, when you cool water to turn it into ice or any substance, uh, then heat is given out as the liquid goes back to a solid. Uh, the same is true when you have the liquid changing into vapor, because when gas molecules, vapor molecules, are much more separated than in a liquid. In a liquid, although they're free to move, in the same way as a gas, they are much closer together. And there's still attractive forces between liquid atoms and molecules. In gases, the, there's a much, much bigger separation than in a liquid. And also the force between uh, atoms and molecules of a gas is negligible. Essentially, it doesn't exist, which, which will explain more when we come to the idea of an ideal gas. But in liquids then, although molecules move about randomly, like they do in a the gas, they're much closer together, and they also attract each other a bit. So in order to convert, you have to, again, separate the atoms and molecules. So when your water, for example, is being boiled and you're supplying heat, the heat doesn't increase the kinetic energy, it increases the separation. So there's no temperature change. So T stays at 100 degrees centigrade until all the water t goes into vapor. Similarly, if you're cooling vapor down, so it goes into water, heat is given out, but the heat that's given out doesn't change the um, kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules, rather, they just become closer together. And as they come closer together, they give out, they give out uh, heat. Um, are, are there any questions on that? Essentially, essentially, this is why the temperature doesn't change during a phase change. Is that clear? This is the conclusion. Uh, if there are no... There, by the way, in my notes, a lot of this is uh, explanation, which I've just given you, so uh, I'll leave you to read that, that part of the notes. But are there any questions before, before we go to the next thing? Okay, if there are no questions. Um, thermal expansion. If a body, if you take a solid and you heat a solid, and you're not... Here we're not thinking of heating it so much that it becomes a liquid. You're just heating a, I don't know, piece of copper or a piece of iron. You just heat it uh, 
at normal temperatures, uh, the solid is going to expand. And so with uh, thermal expansion, then we're looking at, at a formula as to how much a solid uh, expands or contracts. If you heat the thing, it will expand. If you cool it, it contracts. The amount by which it contracts is the same whether you're heating or whether you're cooling. And it depends on the temperature change. Um, the three things we can consider. One is, is a thin wire. So when you heat it, its length changes. We can think of a, of a flat thing. So when you heat it, its area changes. Or we can think of a, a block of something. And when we heat it, its volume changes. So let's begin with a wire or a thin bar, heated. Uh, its expansion, if it's very thin, the expansion is mostly along its length. We don't have to worry about the tiny expansion of its uh, cross-section. So the increase in length then is proportional to its original length and the temperature change. If, if you heat it, then this increases. If you cool it by the same amount, it decreases by the same amount. The constant of proportionality, this is a proportionality, proportionality sign, and this is the Greek letter alpha. Uh, they look the same, unfortunately. Um, but this is the coefficient, this constant of proportionality is the coefficient of linear expansion. So again, it's another important formula. To find the units of the coefficient of linear expansion, make alpha the subject. This is how to find the units of anything. You make it the subject of its defining formula, and then you put the units in of the quantities that you know. This is a length divided by a length, so it has no units. We're dividing by temperature, so the units of alpha is 1 over degrees Kelvin or 1 over degrees centigrade. These are the SI units. Uh, any questions on that? Fairly clear? In a similar way, if we have a flat, thin, flat object, so its area changes, we have a, you can see it's an equivalent formula, except the coefficient uh, of area expansion, you have a different coefficient, basically. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Uh, so does it mean that uh, when you heat up uh, a solid ice or water, the, the volume changes? Yes. You know, it depends. If you have ice, for example, it depends on the temperature what, what's going to happen to the thing. Let me just make sure we, we distinguish between phase changes and just heating. Huh? Okay. Let me just... Uh, let me just start with a piece of metal, iron or, or something like that. I, I can't remember what its temperature, its melting point is, but it's probably something... Look, I'm just guessing. I don't know. Huh? I've forgotten. Maybe some of you might know. If this is iron, it melts at a very high temperature. It might even be much higher than this. But if you're at room temperature, 20 degrees, and you want to increase its temperature by up to 50 degrees, for example, and you heat it, it's going to expand if you heat it. Or if you cool it, it's going to contract. Um, Phase changes occur only when you get to near the melting points of these substances. So we're looking at temperatures far away from when they change phase. And even ice, if you have, if you have ice at, say, minus 40 degrees centigrade, and you heat it a bit to, say, uh, minus 15 degrees centigrade, the ice is going to expand. It's not going to melt. It won't melt until you heat it to the point where it reaches zero degrees. That's when it will start to melt. But before that, it's going to expand. If you cool it from here to here, it's going to contract. Uh, is that your question? Was that your question? Yes, sir. Right. So let's be clear. We're far away from any phase change when we're applying heat in, in here. Now, when... I'll explain isotropic in a minute. When the solid is isotropic, there's a relationship between the coefficient of area expansion and the coefficient of linear expansion. It is this simple relationship. Gamma is equal to two alpha. This is true for an isotropic solid. 
Now, what does isotropic mean? Um, isotropic just means that the properties of something is the same in every direction. There's two things that you'll come across. There's homogeneous and there's isotropic. Homo homogeneous means that the properties are uniform throughout the solid. Uh, properties Let me just change his position a bit. Properties are uniform. For example, the density stays the same everywhere. Isotropic specifically means, that if I measure density along this direction, or I measure density along this direction or this direction, it stays the same. In other words, when you say a substance is isotropic, its properties stay the same in any direction that you, you do the measurements. And when a, a solid is isotropic then, we have that relationship between the coefficient of area expansion and the coefficient of linear expansion. Um, when we come to volume now, again, if you heat a, a block of something, it changes its, its volume. If you cool it, the volume decreases. If you heat it, the volume increases. This time we have uh, the constant of proportionality is beta, the coefficient of volume expansion. And once again, if the solid is isotropic, there's a, re a simple relationship between beta uh, and the coefficient of linear expansion, beta equals three alpha. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, again, all of these are important formulas. Uh, it always helps to memorize these things. And what is this thing now? Or oh, one thing to mention, uh, these formulas only apply at temperatures, at normal temperatures. When you get, for example, near the boiling points of things or, or near melting points, these things don't, these formulas are not very accurate. So these formulas are only accurate in certain certain ranges. For example, I can say normal normal temperature changes, uh, 10 degrees to 15 degrees, 20 degrees to 60 degrees. Temperatures, are, the exact range depends on the material. Um, so keep that in mind that these formulas are not exact. Uh, as temperature gets goes go very high or very low, these formulas don't work anymore. Uh, let me ask you a question on the board, if anyone... Now, we know when, when we heat something, it's going to expand. Uh, now, supposing I have... So let me call it a flat iron plate. And this thing has a hole in it. Now this thing has a hole in it, so I heat it. Uh, take a Bunsen burner, heat this thing. Now we know it's going to expand in all directions. What happens to the hole? Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? It gets smaller. It gets it's smaller. smaller. So everyone says that as I heat it, this is going to happen. Huh? So I expand like this. Is that what you're saying? Is this what you're saying? The hole gets yes. smaller? Does everybody agree with that? Uh, yes. It's actually wrong. It actually doesn't. Yeah, it's, it it's wrong. It gets bigger. So when you heat 
a metal plate like this with a hole in it, the hole gets bigger, it doesn't get smaller. In fact, what's going to happen is, if I had iron, the same dimensions as the hole, and I heat the iron, the same material in other words, and the same size of hole, when I heat this, say, by temperature difference delta T equals TH minus TC, and if I heat this by the same amount, the iron will expand exactly the same way as the hole, or the hole will expand in exactly the same way as a solid piece of iron. So when you're doing these kind of problems, and you ask for whether the hole will get bigger or smaller, if you heat it, it gets bigger. If you cool it, it gets smaller. And the way to calculate is to picture the hole as a solid piece of metal. And the same formula applies. Um, in this case, we'll, it'll be area. The, so we'll be using the formula for the area expansion. Okay, you'll have to believe me that that's the case, unless you want to get a, a block with a hole in it and start heating it. But it does get bigger, not smaller. Uh, is that convincing, or you're not convinced? It's convincing, sir. Okay. In any case, you can. This is the way it works. If you check all of this stuff. Uh, when a solid with a, a hole is heated, both the hole and the solid expand. When a solid with a hole is cooled, both the hole and the solid contract. Um, I'm afraid these, when I scan, some of these uh, marks come out, especially because I use pencil to write, and when you rub things out, you, you, get, you still get images when you scan. So I don't always have time to clean the pages up. Uh, in conclusion, a hole in a material expands or contracts in the same way as a solid material of the same size and shape. And that should be an E there. Uh, any questions before we go on to heat transfer? Okay, it's fairly clear. Okay, transfer of heat. Now there are three mechanisms by which heat is transferred. One is conduction, the other one is convection, and the third one is radiation. Uh, let's look at conduction. Before we look at the formula, let's look at conduction, at conduction, conduction if I can say it. Uh, let's go to the whiteboard again. Now, what is the mechanism for conduction of heat? For this, let's go back to a solid rod. Again, as I've said, solids were made up of atoms which vibrate. And they have some kind, solids normally have some kind of crystal structure. Uh, where is it? Uh, Solids have some kind of crystal structure, which I draw like this for simplicity. Now, as I said, with the kinetic theory of, of kinetic theory in general, temperature is related to kinetic energy of the molecules. I mean, the molecules, all the molecules may have uh, different energies. So if we have a let me put a gas in a container. The molecules are flying about all over the place. And the gas always expands to fill, uh, to fill the volume of the container. So molecules are uh, rushing about at random all over the place. In a liquid, it's a similar thing, except liquids have a definite uh, volume for a particular temperature. But again, you have random movement. The difference is the separation and also... In gases, molecules, there's no a negligible attraction between the molecules or atoms. In a liquid, there's can be significant attraction even though they are separated. And although uh, atoms or molecules may have different velocities, but the average increases as you heat. So they get faster and faster as you apply heat, or they get slower and slower as you cool down. 
This is true whether it's a gas, whether it's a liquid, or whether it's a solid. But with a solid, the increases in the vibration uh, as you apply heat. So if I apply heat to one end, again, I get a Bunsen burner uh, and apply heat here. As I apply heat, this thing starts to vibrate faster and faster. As it vibrates faster and faster, it bashes an adjacent molecules. So they move faster and faster. So as each molecule starts vibrating more and more, it bashes its neighbor. I mean, they may not actually hit each other because there are forces between them that will make them move. So they may not actually hit each other directly, but the attractive forces, the electromagnetic forces between them, one way or another, they're going to get pushed. So they increase their vibrational energy, which corresponds to the increase in temperature. And this goes all the way down. So eventually, starts out here, this is cold. Eventually, as you heat this sufficiently, uh, this temperature eventually goes to temperature hot. So that's conduction then. Molecules, if you like, molecules, faster molecules bashing the slower molecules, increasing their vibrational, their vibrational speeds, therefore increasing their temperature. Um, that's conduction. And conduction then is the main, is a, a, a main mechanism for the transmission of heat through a, a solid. Uh, the other thing is uh, convection. Convection is the way that heat is transmitted in liquids, or gases for that matter. Uh, even gases. Um, for example, air near the ground, as it gets, as it gets heated by the surface of the earth, uh, the warmer air rises upwards. But let's just look at it for a liquid which is easier to picture. If I apply heat, it's the same mechanism for gases as for liquids. So, have I lost the connection? Let me admit some people. Uh, is it still here? Yeah. So as I heat here, as I heat the liquid and the molecules start moving a bit more quickly, their density decreases. So let me just say this bit has been heated. The density of this thing gets a bit less than the density of, of the, of the uh, liquid at a cooler temperature. As the density decreases because it's gotten hotter and it's expanded, volume has expanded, the molecules are further apart, therefore density is less, this thing starts to rise and cooler liquid comes in to take its place. It gets heated, it starts to rise. And this is convection. And convection is a transfer of heat by the physical movement of a body of the fluid. So the hot bit of the fluid actually moves to a different position, colder fluid comes in its place, it gets heated and moves about. So conduction is bashing of the molecules and convection is the physical movement of the fluid itself. And we'll come to radiation uh, in a bit. Now for conduction, there's a, there's a simple formula for conduction. If I take a slab of material of thickness delta L and its area A and the temperature difference, this is TH on this side and this is uh, the colder temperature on this side. So obviously heat is going to flow from hot to cold. TH is greater than TC. Now we have a formula for the amount of heat that flows per second or per unit time. And the rate of flow is given by this, delta Q by delta T. The amount of fluid, fluid um, the amount of heat transferred per unit time. Now how do we get a formula for this? Well, the first thing to ask yourself is what makes the heat transfer more quickly? The bigger the temperature change, or, or sorry, the bigger the temperature difference, the more heat will flow across the slab per unit time. 
if this area is bigger, then again, more heat will flow uh, through the slab per unit time, or the block, but slab or block. But if I increase the length, delta L, the, the thicker this thing is, the longer it takes heat to go across it. So the longer the length, the less heat flows per unit time as length increases. So this means that the transfer of heat is proportional to the area, proportional to the temperature difference, but inversely proportional to the thickness. And so this is my formula there. And this is how you can remember the formula. By, by guessing what things make heat get transferred more quickly. Where is it? Okay, so I've got proportional to the area, difference in temperature, and inversely proportional to the thickness of the block. And the constant of proportionality is called the thermal conductivity. So again, as we get to use this in, in questions, you, you know, the, all of these formulas, when you get to use them, you, you become familiar with them. But it's worth memorizing them. Um, Something I've said before, when you're dealing with temperature differences, it doesn't matter if you use degrees centigrade or degrees Kelvin, you'll get the same answer because the size of the unit is the same. But as I say, in, in general, aside from differences, in general formula, Kelvin must be used. But for this formula, involving a difference in temperature, we can use either unit. Now, the unit of thermal conductivity, as before, this is the defining formula. If I make K the subject, uh, then I've got, well, this is my uh, K the subject and my formula. Delta L is measured in meters. The rate of flow of heat is joules per second. Area is meters squared. Difference in temperature is degrees Kelvin. Uh, the meters, well, this cancels to 1 m, k. Joules per second is power. Power is, uh, is energy divided by time. So joules per second is the unit called the watt. So we have watts per meter per degree Kelvin, or equivalently per degree centigrade. Uh, any questions on that? Again, You'll become more familiar with these when you actually use these in calculation. Now, convection, there isn't actually any easy formula for convection. In specific situations, people have devised formulas, but these are very specialized, and we, we're not going to go into such detail. So, essentially, with convection, there is no simple formula that we're going to use. Uh, the last method of uh, heat transfer is radiation. This is when you heat something. Uh, for example, we can take a lump of metal. You heat it a lot. It starts to go orange, red, and it radiates electromagnetic radiation. And the part that's normally raises the temperatures of things is the infrared, infrared range of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. But the main thing we're interested in here is that you, the heat is transferred by radiation. So if you take a lump of body and heat it up, it radiates energy. In particular, the, the atoms get excited, the electrons jump to higher levels, and then when they de-excite, they emit they emit electromagnetic radiation. The mechanism, though, is interesting, but it's not needed for what we're going to do. We're just going to consider radiation. Uh, and again, it's how much uh, radiation is given out per second. Uh, this is an experimental law, by the way. So it's found by experiment that the rate of emission of heat by a body is proportional to t, uh, the temperature to the power of four. 
Again, this is an experimental result. And it also depends on the surface area. The area here is the surface area of the body. It also depends on this quantity called the emissivity. Now, the emissivity is a number between 0 and 1. And it's a measure of whether a body is a good absorber or a good emitter of radiation. A good absorber is also a good emitter of radiation. Uh, some bodies, of course, are very good absorbers and, also, and hence very good emitters. Other bodies are very bad absorbers and hence very bad emitters. Uh, a number, an E close to 1, means that something is a very good emitter and absorber of radiation. When E is close to 0, it means the material is very bad at absorbing and emitting radiation. Um, so this is at my emissivity. E is a number between 0 and 1 which measures how well a body absorbs or emits energy. A good absorber of radiation is also a good emitter. For good emitters, hence absorbers, E is nearly 1. Dull or black bodies are usually good emitters and absorbers. A very good absorber or emitter of radiation is called a black body. Uh, and an example of which is a cavity, which I'll, I'll explain on the whiteboard. Uh, for bad absorbers or emitters of radiation, E is nearly zero, and shiny reflective surfaces such as silver or a mirror are bad absorbers or emitters of radiation. So E equals one is the best emitter. The dullest objects, E equals zero, the poorest emitters. Uh, and dull objects are usually good absorbers and emitters, and bright objects are usually bad absorbers or emitters. I'll come to the black body in a minute. Um, the proportionality constant in this formula, this is a, a proportionality here. Like all proportionalities, if you find the right constant, uh, this becomes an equal sign. Now, the constant of proportionality in this formula is this thing called sigma, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant and it's given by this watts per meter squared uh, Kelvin per Kelvin to the power of 4 so this again is an important formula uh, which gives us how much heat a body radiates at a temperature T4 but just as a as the body emits radiation at a particular temperature it also absorbs temperature from the atmosphere so we have exactly the same formula for how much a body absorbs atmosphere from its surroundings. So get, whoops. So if we have a body, as well as emitting energy, according to its temperature, it also, it also absorbs radiation according to the temperature of the surroundings. The formula is the same. Area of the body is the same. The difference is the temperature of the body and the temperature of the surroundings. It's actually the, the difference which gives you the net absorption or emission. So in reality, you take account of whether a body absorbs or emits overall depends on whether the surrounding temperature is greater than the temperature of the body. If the surrounding temperature is greater, then the body the, the net radiation is absorbed. If the temperature of the body is greater than the surroundings, then the net amount of radiation is emitted. So these are the formulas then. Um, I want to say something a bit more about black bodies. Um, It won't hurt if I tell you a little bit about Lord Kelvin. I'll come to black bodies in a minute. Uh, Lord Kelvin, I think it was around about, just before 1900, somewhere around 1900, 1900 or 1901. I can't remember the exact time. 
And he was giving a talk at the London Society. And in this talk, Kelvin identified two experiments which he said were slight problems. One was a negative results of what was called the Michelson Morley experiment. Now, the Michelson Morley experiment is not what we're doing now, but it had to do with measuring the speed of light in different directions. And the result was that the speed of light was the same whether you measured in the direction of the Earth or perpendicular to the Earth, uh, i.e. the velocity of light is the same relative to any moving object. That was one experiment. Another one is what called, what's called black body radiation. And this is what I'm particularly interested in. What I was saying to you about a black body being a good emitter or absorber, one of the best black bodies is to take a cavity like this. And when light comes into this cavity, it kind of bounces about all over the place. Each time it, 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 it bounces off a surface, some of it is absorbed. So very little light escapes. So this is why a black body like this for example, clay or some material like that. This is why it's called a very good absorber. Now, a good absorber is also a good emitter. And what people did in 1900, or in an experiment just before that, was to heat this thing up, actually before 1900, but the explanation came in 1900, is to heat this thing up and see the radiation coming out. Because as we say, a good absorber is also a good emitter. And when they drew a graph, I won't go into details, when they drew a graph of this thing, they found that as you increase temperature, the color distribution that came out, red, blue, well, as it got hotter and hotter, the color of radiation came from dark red, lighter red, orange, yellow, that way. And this is what they found in the experiment as temperature increased. This was, well, I won't go into the details of that. And then classical theory, electromagnetic theory, gave you a result like this. So the results of this experiment contradicted uh, electromagnetic theory. The, the results of this experiment contradicted uh, the law of relative velocity. Uh, again, I won't go into details. The point is this. What Lord Kelvin said was that people should not go into theoretical physics because all of physics was finished in 1900. And there was no more theoretical stuff to be done except there were these two problems, these two experiments which could not be explained by classical theory. Now I mention this because this experiment led to Einstein's special theory of relativity. And the explanation of this, of this experiment led to what's called quantum mechanics. Both were revolutions in physics. So Lord Kelvin picked his clouds very well. He's, he would say there are only two small clouds on the horizon. Uh, and, that th uh, and apart from these two small clouds, theoretical physics was finished. Instead, these two small clouds led to revolutions in physics. Uh, I couldn't resist digressing uh, on this. Quantum mechanics, by the way, gives you the descriptions, the behavior of atoms and molecules. All your TVs and your phones and what have you, without quantum mechanics, you wouldn't have them. The smartphones wouldn't be there. Uh, that's just a, a little bit on the black body radiation. Um, I think um, there's one more formula, but I don't think I need to rush this. I'll leave it for tomorrow. Are there any questions before we, before we go? No questions? Uh, sir, go ahead. Uh, uh, according to heat transfer, uh, you find that uh, some tanks have been painted green and white. Does it uh, does it does it heat transfer 
have any go on that like how can you explain that like what are tanks being painted uh, I, i'm not really following your question how, how do i explain this heat transfer when yeah, like you find that uh, water tanks have been painted either green or white. No, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm, no, they they are usually black, not white. White. They're black, black and green. The black yeah, the reason for this is because it's what I was saying to you before: whether something is a good emitter or a good absorber. Um. Let's clear this. This is what I was. This is exactly what I was saying about emissivity. Uh, a black color. If you have something painted black, black is a good absorber. That's why it's black, because it absorbs all the radiation. It absorbs colors, doesn't it? So it doesn't. It doesn't reflect very much. That's why something is black. You see, when you see something, if I see, for example, a red cup. I see a red cup because as radiation fall, as light falls on it, you know the white light from the sun, it falls on the red cup. But what's reflected is just the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you see it as red. But with a black object, it doesn't reflect any color. So you don't, you don't see any color, you just see black. But as I say, this is a good, and this is also true for heat, by the way, as well as um, with ordinary light that we see, there's also the infrared radiation, which is, what happens is not all radiation increases kinetic energy. It depends on, on wave, what the wavelengths are. Ordinary light sometimes excites atoms inside atoms, but infrared radiation, that particular frequency tends to make things vibrate more. This is why, Infrared radiation is associated with heat. So a black body is a good absorber of infrared radiation. So if you want to keep something hot and keep heat inside, you make it black because it absorbs radiation. It also doesn't emit um, when well, it's a good emitter. But the main thing is it absorbs radiation, so it helps to keep things hot. Are you sure it's black sometimes? Because uh, a water tank, silver or black? What what color are they? Usually silver. No, they're black. So here we have Kiboko water tanks, which are always black. Well, black tends to be, um, well, it's it abs it absorbs uh, light. It's a good absorber. So if you're relying on the sun heating the tank, then a black is a good color because it helps to absorb heat and keep the tank warm. Is that, is it warm? But it's just water tanks, isn't it? It's not, is, do you want the water to be hot or cold? In your water tanks, do you want it hot or cold? Cold, sir. Cold. Uh, I think it just depends. But anyway, I'm not quite sure which way around you want it. If, if you want to reflect heat, it's silver. If you want to absorb heat, uh, then it can be black. The other thing is black on the other side of the coin is that a good absorber is also a good emitter. So depending on the temperature of the surroundings and the temperature of the water, black will also help to cool it down if the surroundings are cooler. So it, it depends which way things are. If the surroundings if there's radiation coming in, it will tend to heat the water because uh, black is a good absorber. If on the other hand, the temperature of the surroundings is less than the water, then it's also a good emitter, so it, it'll tend to cool. So it depends like, on the situation, I think. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk too much because I don't know that much about water tanks. It, it, it's only what I've said. Black color will absorb and emit a silver color uh, is a bad absorber and a bad emitter. So you have to decide yourselves what you want to do with the water. Uh, I mean, I'm afraid that's the best that I can do. Uh, does that answer your question anyway? Yes, sir. With, without knowing the details of, of, of the application, a dark, dark color like black is a good absorber or emitter. Uh, a bright color like white is a bad absorber or emitter. 
even when you wear wearing clothes in the sun, you tend to want to wear white or something to, to reflect to reflect the light. In winter, you want to wear like darker clothes, which which absorb heat a, a, a better. All right then, uh, I better stop. Oh, I've already overshot. Uh, okay, I better stop. Uh, Say again. Let me stop recording. Uh, you want to ask a yeah, question before that. I stop? Is it all right? Go ahead. In, is it all right? Go ahead. Yeah, is it all right if I can ask a question over the previous session? If what? Say again, I'm not understanding. Is it all right if, if I can ask a question over temperature yes, you, and pressure? Yes. yes, you can. Go ahead. Yes, uh, on on the examples, the solved examples, question number three, uh, which states an ideal gas has a volume of exactly one liter at 1.008 atm and 20 and 20 degrees so when taking data you actually included a negative let me see the solution I, I can't remember this is my, this was my example was it are you talking yes it was a, it was among your examples uh, let me go and find it's not it's in a different uh, it's in a different file oh it's here uh, let me see which question you're talking about. Question number three. Right, let me go to number three. But in fact, I can I can bring it up. Thank you. I, I can show you here actually on the on the board. Let me find it. Okay, that would be that would be fine. Come on. And let me get rid of the other stuff. Forgot to count, and this is it. Question number three, you say? Yes, sir. Oh, here we go. Right, an ideal gas has a volume of exactly one liter at one atmosphere and 20 degrees. How many atmospheres of pressure must be applied for the gas to be compressed to 0.5 liters? when the temperature is 40 degrees? Uh, yes. Uh, so what have we done, got here? T1 then. So I've called the initial temperatures V1, T1, and P1. V1 is one liter. This is 20. T2 is 40. This is minus 20. Is that, have I got that right? Or is this, did I make a mistake with this? So I want to understand why he, it's negative 20 instead of 20. It could be that I made a mistake, either in the question. I have a feeling. Let me, it's, it, it, this is just a mistake on my, I made a mistake. Either I made a mistake here. I think I made a mistake in the original question, though. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, look, I'll check it for you, but I think definitely... Okay, let me just say, if this is the correct thing, then what I did here was wrong. It should be a plus, because we're going from 20 degrees to 40 degrees. It could be the question, because I'm using, obviously, questions from a book. I changed them a bit, but the questions were, it might have been in the book, it was minus 20. Uh, so let me, ch thank you for pointing that out. I'll check to see if the mistake is here or if the mistake is here. Either way, this cannot be correct. Uh, I'll check that for you. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Paul. All right, then. I better stop recording, and see you tomorrow.